I know this is not the giant throngs here, so but if if anybody has any questions at all, anybody? No. How long did it take to make? Uh, four years, and uh, it was done on a zero budget, so <laughs> we just uh, robbed liquor stores on weekends in order to raise money for it. Yeah. Oh, uh, and um, these guys, it, it, it became kind of a conspiracy between the three of us, I guess, to get this thing done. Uh, and um, let's see, I don't want to, yes. Yes. Huh? Oh, I know Peter, when we were doing uh, theater up, doing theater up in uh, Chicago, he, we met him through some other people, and that would have been like in uh, mid-80s, something like that, and we've been buddies ever since. We've we went fishing a few times, and uh, and, and and I should say that uh, that uh, it really started out. Peter went up to the Wisconsin when we did that mural. He wanted to he he wanted to archive stuff for me so I'd have it, and it and it sat in up on the shelf in the studio. And he every time I did something, he'd go shoot it around that time, and and we had it sitting there. And he said one day while I was fishing, why don't we put this all together and do something. I said, well, okay. And we started putting it together. He said, well, I better interview you and maybe flesh it out. And he said, then, well, maybe we should go to West Virginia and shoot some pictures there. And then we started, well, then we got an interview. And then I guess we had a whole bunch of stuff. Well, I, I know it's a really big mistake to try to edit your own work, especially in a documentary uh, as a director. So uh, I ran into Libby on the beach uh, Martha and I, my wife, uh, and our little dog met her little dogs, and, and I was like, hey, oh, Libby, because uh, we went to film school together, the three of us. And uh, I said, I got this film, it's a train wreck, because I'm trying to cut it myself, and I don't know what the hell I'm doing, because uh, I kind of backed my way into the film as opposed to having a plan to begin with. And I said, I really need an editor who's good with story and structure. And she said, oh, yeah. So that was I said, great. that's me. That's right. That's an and understatement. It, yeah. And so if you'll notice in the credits, she's a co-writer and co-producer and editor because she really. I took over. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so some of that chronology that he was describing was actually uh, after a point where she said, we need this, and then... Every time we sat, they would come over to my little editing studio, and Michael would start talking. He talks. <laughs> oh, Lord, he talks. And he would start, he would say things, and I was like, this is fascinating. Why isn't this in the film? We've got to do another interview. So, and, that, and, and why aren't we talking more about cancer? And why aren't we talking about this? And, and just that whole story about how he got into grad school, how he went up there and lined up all the paintings and said, you know, ha, give me some money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I said, oh, uh, that's, that's got to go in the film. So, yeah, so we did more interviews just because yeah, Libby, stuff kept coming out. Libby, Libby did a lot. I mean, I think that's yeah. an understatement because, you know, once she got the, well, both of them working together, I, you know, I, my job was to find photographs. We just gang <laughs> ganged up on him. But I do have to say there was a point toward the end where she would say certain things like, oh, we need to go shoot this. And I'd be like, I don't want to shoot anymore. Watch out. But, oh. I don't really want to shoot anymore, but okay. I wanted to go to West Virginia. <laughs> yeah, there was a second trip to West Virginia in the offing that I was. He wouldn't take me. Yes, ma'am. Well, parts of it's kind of sad. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, for, for me, there's Aunt Leela, she's gone, and uh, Dad, Mom, uh, you know, uh, all those people that I, 
was drawing pictures of, and some of them out there, they're all gone. And uh, I think that's the reason I, I concentrated on it so much. Yeah, and, and, and going to West Virginia, we were able to meet with, uh, with her and, and interview her, and she had had a fall. Yeah, uh, she's got a black eye if you didn't notice. About a week before, I think. No, that, that, that morning. Was it that day? Yeah, that morning. She, anyway. she tipped over. And so I was kind of like, oh, boy, this is going to be rough. Because she was saying, I don't know if I want to be on camera because i got a black eye. And, all. and I, I said, no, 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 it's all right. We'll be, we'll, I'll favor your, your good side. <laughs> but uh, she, it was really lovely being able to interview her. And, um, She's sharp. Yeah, sharp, very sharp, and had a lot of interesting things to say. And um, and and so that was a privilege to be able to see her and interview her. Um, his uncle, I mean his cousin Jim, took us up way up where that cabin was from the 1870s and stuff. And when we got there, I said, "Oh, we'll just drive my car up," you know. And he was like, "No, <laughs> your car won't make it where we're going." And so we ended up taking this truck and going all up in places where I don't know if I want, I mean, it was beautiful, don't get me wrong, but it was terrifying. You'd be looking out over the edge of the road and there'd be trucks down in the valley that had, you could pick any vintage from the 20s or teens all the way through to present day and see vehicles down in the, the holler, as they say. And it, it was terrifying, but. Uh, yeah, my uncle Delano used to say, if you drove off the side of the mountain, don't worry about hitting the bottom, you'd starve to death before you got yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's beautiful, but there's also aspects of it that are pretty heartbreaking because even to this day, you'll be standing there like in the op uh, part opening of the film when he's standing and looking out over that beautiful vista, if you turned around, they were knocking the top of the mountain off yeah. to get at the coal. I mean, that's how bad it is. And everywhere you went, and there's not a lot of footage in the film of that stuff because you can't stop your car and take out a camera and film it because there'll be some private security guy right up on your ass immediately. We had that happen to us in that there's running footage of us going by all those uh, refinery stacks. And we literally had to run and gun out of the car window because we tried to stop. And every time we tried to stop, there'd be some unmarked black uh, pickup truck with these guys in there, thugs basically, that are hired to make sure that you're not filming anywhere around the premises. So. Uh, it was a little dicey at times. You'd just be going around and you'd be like, oh God, how can I even get any footage of them tearing down the mountain? Because they don't let you see it. But there's big holding pools of slurry because what they do with coal now is they extract the coal and they crush it up and then they treat it with water and chemicals to remove the impurities before they load it on the train cars. So when you see train cars go by of coal now, um, it's not like when we were kids and it would be big lumps of coal. It's this granulated, very fine black coal. And when that chemical in water washes out the impurities, it goes into these big slurry holding ponds. And then they sit there and... and it goes into the groundwater. And yeah. Does a but the one thing that you had to realize is that all my family had major cancer. Half my high school class is dead from cancer. That, that there's, there's something there in the water and in the air. And, you know, as we, being a kid, you know, you don't pay attention to it. But when I was a kid, I'd go down into the river and I'd come back out and I'd have a black sock on my foot from where all the coal dust was in the river. And uh, it, it's, it's just something that as we got to put that in the film <laughs> well you know I, I i think anybody who's grown up around any kind of industrial thing like that realizes that you know 
your health is the least thing they concern about, <laughs> you know. And, yeah. uh, and, 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 and being isolated in West Virginia, too, is also uh, uh, a lot of things go un, unseen by anybody other than the people there. So, and as they, as they tear the place up, people like, like us get out of there as much as we can, you know. Well, even going to Huntington to film interviews with um, Don, uh, yeah, yeah, Don Van Horn, Don Van Horn, the uh, dean of the School of Art there in, at Marshall, we rolled in there, and it's a beautiful town, and it's right on the Ohio River, uh, and Marshall's a beautiful campus, but the air you can cut it with a knife. You come and, in there, and it's ground like ground zero for the opioid. Oh yeah, crisis. yeah. It's well, like I said, when I, when I was a kid, right, it was wide open. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> your, uh, your eyes are stinging when you arrive, and they don't stop stinging till you leave. We were only there for a day. A couple of days, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was like, oh, my God, if I grew up in this, it's like growing up in a toxic soup. It really is. And, and that's, it's kind of terrifying in a lot of ways because uh, – who knows what's going on where you can't see it, you know what I mean, the, the hidden things. And um, like when they take the top off one of these mountains, they dump it into the valleys. So all the water's just po poisoned. Well, yeah, there's it. creeks and stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. And, uh, but the people are lovely. I mean, warm. No, really. I mean, it's, it's such a contrast in a lot of ways. Everyone that we met was pretty welcoming and... and uh, of course, they didn't know I was making a movie about it. Huh? Okay. Anybody got any questions? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Sir. Do you feel like you, your cancer is caused by this? I'm pretty sure it, 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 it had something to do with it, to tell you the truth. Because I was, I was uh, you know, I was 40. I mean, a lot of my family and my aunts and uncles had all lived up in there had just had cancer, too. And, and it's, you know, what they always say, well, you can't really point at what exactly what it is. It could be heredity. It could be this. But when, when, when they go up in a holler and there's this very obscure brain cancer and, and there's 22 people out of, out of 35 people up in this holler who all have that, and they, and they range from ages from 2 years old to, to 70 and all the way in between, how can, how can you not say that, that what? That that where I grew up and 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 what I ingested and what's going on, you know, actually when where I grew up it was it was it was thick with woods and 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 squirrels to shoot and and fish to catch, you know. But I don't think it's in like that anymore. Uh, I I don't know if I, I don't know if. I think my anger was that I had to get out of there as fast as I could. I think I think I knew at, at an early age that that if I wanted to be something other than 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 what they had planned out for me, you know, that 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 escape was was the answer and education was 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 the vehicle of escape. And I think anybody who growed up uh, working class or or anything like that who wanted to achieve something in their lives the you can you can lay it on the uh, the doorstep of a couple of really dedicated teachers yeah yep June uh, without those two, I wouldn't be sitting here She was a school teacher. Well, there you go. And, and that comes through because she had that education because she knew where to get your resources. And that, that changes people's lives. Yeah. It's yeah. such a powerful... I mean, you were born destined to be an artist. And I, you have artists who are born in all these different places where the culture might not you know, embrace that. 
Well, Leela says that artists don't really have a choice, and I, I do believe that. Um, it's a blessing and a curse, you know. I, I'm a teacher also, and I tell, I teach uh, people how to make films, and uh, I tell them, you're, okay, you're in class here, abracadabra, you're all artists now. Yes. You're blessed and cursed at the same time, sorry, you know because that, that is the case. It's, you know, you could make the general indictment that this is a somewhat anti-intellectual society and that if you are a creative person, you're somewhat suspect right out of the gate. And so uh, working from that premise, it is really tough to take that on. And coming from, I think for me, that's one of the most interesting threads of Michael's story is that he came from a circumstance where considering, oh, I think I'm going to be a fine art painter is one of the least likely routes to choose, and yet he had the determination to put himself through school and learn the, the, all, everything he needed to learn to be a fine artist and to be relentlessly persistent. And uh, that kind of tenacity uh, has served him well you know, as an artist, it also drives a lot of people crazy around them. Yeah. <laughs> She's very disciplined. She, we had a lot of footage and I had already started doing interviews and she said, well, the first thing is I want you to have all of the interviews transcribed and there's services for that. So you send the footage, she knew a good service. I sent all the footage there, um, got the transcriptions and she works very old school, which is that she does a paper edit of the interviews. So she goes through and edits the uh, transcriptions into a structure that helps Tell the story. Well, you guys listen, listened and read the, the interviews and start to chop it up into pieces and what's, you know, what's about West Virginia and what's about art and how it feels about it and what's about the cancer. And then, uh, and then try and bring in, it's a lot of Michael's voice, but try and bring in the other voices from the other interviews and have it make sense and have it keep flowing. Uh, I mean, there are times when it's just sort of like se I seem to jump to a new topic, but uh, it's still, it, it, yeah, that it still works. And it worked for me, you know, and I'm, I'm obviously, I'm the first audience of anything I do. <laughs> so, um, so, so it's a lot of it is just, you know, I, I've actually been doing that process for a lot of years. And I had a, a director once say to me, well, do you know what the script's going to be? And I said, I said, no, but I trust my process. And you need to trust it, my process, too. Because there's no way to know in the beginning what, what is the story going to be. I'd like to say that Peter made this happen. He put all the money in it. Well, yeah, all, all the money. <laughs> he all did. All those liquor stores I had to hit. No, it's uh, the truth. I mean, how many people will lay down that kind of money for you to tell your story? It was in small increments, but thank you. I, no, I, you know, the, the thing about it is, is uh, um, as far as consistency of vision, we were all on three on the same page pretty quickly. Uh, about the story that we wanted to tell and what the important focus of it was. And again, I, it was mostly about, if you want to sum it up in a, what do they call a log line, right? Is uh, how the hell does a guy from the hollers of West Virginia end up becoming a fine art painter and have success and get known in the world because it's so unlikely. And that kind of is, is the main impetus of it, I, I think. I, you can, well, I think I usually approach things where it's like he's a very interesting character, and it's like <laughs> it's like uh, I want to know 
more, I want to reveal what makes the guy, this guy tick, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to share the, the charm and the quirkiness of this individual. Uh, and he has both those things, you know, in, in abundance. People often say he's charming and quirky as he's walking away from them. <laughs> I, I, my wife, Jean, got, got real sick. She's supposed to be here, and she would, wanted to be here, but she got, she got really sick the last Some couple of days you know. and just thought that the traveling and, 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 and affecting all of us is, uh, would be not the smartest thing for her or us. And, uh, but I tell you what. I wouldn't be sitting here without her. Yeah. Yeah. She's a and she's a, a very talented artist. Yeah, she, in her own she right. does her own graphic she did novels. All the posters and the promotional graphics that you saw for the film, uh, Jean Nemchek that yeah. Michael's wife did. Uh, so she's terrific. And uh, we've had a few other hands in there. Um, Roger McNaughton, thank you so much. You have really saved our lives. Chris Avison and my brother John Hartel composed some lovely music as well, which was really helpful. Uh, and uh, Sienna Esposito, who's a, a fellow teacher, did the little animated graphics, which were terrific. Uh, you know, that's, as far as the cost of making the film and stuff, you know, in small bites it's not as painful, but also, you know, Libby, all the hard work she's done, uh, and, and all the other people who contributed have made it possible because when you're making independent film, um, it, unless you've got some great sugar daddy out there or, uh, you know, a really good at grant writing, which I'm not, you got to figure out some way to do it. And so uh, whenever you get a little extra cash, it's like, yeah, throw it into the movie. What else do I have to do with all that money? <laughs> all right. Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. Any, any more questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Like sort of Here's the dirty secret about PBS. <laughs> they don't pay for anything. They, it, to get this on PBS, we would probably have to have about $25,000. Oh yeah, right, there's a whole system. It's not that we're so much paying them to do it, but then they would, they would say, yeah, we'll put it on, but you have to do this and do that and do the other thing, and it'll be about $25,000. It's the bring me the broom of the Wicked Witch it's, of the West system that they have. It's an actual, it's a, a, the bring me the broom of the Wicked Witch of the West system. There's actually a, a kind of a, brokerage type of arrangement that is, uh, that's the way Sharon, our friend, explained it to me. It's, uh, you have to package it in a certain way that has these built-in costs in order to then vet it to all the, all the affiliates nationally in a way that they can then choose to pick it up or not. But I mean, having said that, it would be fabulous to get I, it on I, PBS. I think, I think the, the, what, what uh, what I gathered too is that for the festivals and and competitions and things and trying to get some kind of a this is the first time anybody but us and a couple other people seen this thing so this was kind of like just kind of bringing it out to see what it would look like on a big screen to get an idea and we got other screenings coming up uh, got into an international film festival la last Sunday uh, uh, at the Grand Grand uh, the Great Lakes. Uh, International Film Festival, which was a nice thing. Uh, uh, we didn't win any any prizes, but you know, at least they let us in the door. And yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Right. About the possibilities that they could attain success in their life. And so there's a, there may be other venues that this film has a possible reach to, and we maybe could have concentrated maybe more even getting students in here. 
Yeah, I mean, I we did go to a couple of art schools. I'm sorry, you were, you were when you were asking about the PBS connection. I'm sorry, I don't even know see who that is, but my cousin Ellen. Oh, Ellen. <laughs> You, so it, was that something that you you have had contacts with or? Oh, sorry. oh damn! <laughs> I was trying to. Yeah. Uh, Independent filmmakers a, are, she's a scout. If, no, if nothing resourceful, you'll always work whatever angle you. Can. If I had to say one thing though, uh, uh, being surviving, being an artist is a success. Uh, all artists. You know, you, you think about making money and doing this and doing that. The 99% of the professional artists in this world who, who get to be 65 and 70 years old and still making work are, are a success because they have learned how to survive and, and, and to have the work speak to people. And, 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 and that's not something that, uh, that they, they hand out easily to people. I think that the uh, perseverance through, uh, obviously, I, I've tried to kill myself three or four times, you know, by watching <laughs> this film, by falling down and, I mean, going, going past my, my limits. And I think that's, my, if I had to put a, a period on what I've tried to do in my work is I, I've tried to, to erase the periods on my limits, and I've tried to push past that. And well, I, and all artists have to. I think make that's compromise. true. I think that's true with musicians. I think it's with authors, with filmmakers, yeah. with editors, with anybody who does anything creative. That we're all pushing. You know, either you can, I could make the same drawing up there and sell it to everybody, or I could keep pushing forward and try to do something that maybe somebody doesn't want, but it's something I have to do. And 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 and, and from that becomes the worth of it. Mm -hmm. And, and the money is, is not that as important as the, as, as the need for me to, to wake up every day knowing that I ain't, I ain't figured it out yet. He still wants the money, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, everybody... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I just, I'm just saying that, you know, success is, is, is not, is, is not who, who liked it the best or how, who paid the most money for it, because I've, I've had that. that but... But the next day, I have to wake up and say, "Well, I got to push past that." Well, and, and it, all uh, creative people make uh, have to make compromises, and uh, so you teach and you you go out and you do commercial work. I did that for decades, uh, and it's not that I didn't gain a lot from that, both in money and in experience. But you reach a certain point where you're kind of like, "Yeah, but I need to make." work that's about what I want to make work about. I'm not, I don't want to put uh, the uh, Pepsi uh, can in the guy's hand while he's talking and, you know, I've, I've done commercials for garage door openers in space. So I can tell you, uh, once you've done that, all bets are off, you can do it. Let me ask you all a question. What what did 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 you feel like it was well put together and you and it kept your interest? That's good. All right. So, yes. Yeah. yes. I was hoping for somebody to say no. So. I <laughs> well, that's gonna kind of happen next that's, week. That's happening next week. Yeah, I've got a big one bench. Big opening at uh, Bradley. University in Peoria on uh, a week from tonight, and we're going to screen the film there. And some of Michael's work is right out here in the lobby as well. Part of the challenge is that uh, his work is, is pretty big. So how do you hang it, and will they let you hang it? Well, I've... Yeah. 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 We're going to work on that. Well, we don't want to belabor this too much. Well, let's end on a high note. Uh, but thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, uh, thank you, Libby and Michael, and everybody else for coming. Okay. Thank you so much.